Today I wanted to discuss the Kunga curse and things associated around that. But um, before I do, I'd actually like to bring up the matter of the wildlife survey that they did and the current corridor, wildlife corridor in green, that does actually keep going over there as well. And they proposed to put the wildlife corridor here. Now, on the planet documents that have been submitted, there is already one discrepancy where they've stuck uh, misty mountains over on this thin strip on this other lot. And there's also other inconsistencies that in the capital expenditure they have costed in investors' building costs and classified them as capital expenditure. And this can actually be confirmed from the documents in DA 21-0010 that they have actually included personal and individual costs of people buying in and padded out the capital expenditure on rainwater tanks and on sewerage treatment plants. There is no specification specifically for people to supply their own solar panels, but there is specifically that when people buy in and they build their own houses, they must install a sewerage treatment plant and they must install water tanks. So if you take out all the padded expenditure that is actually not capital expenditure in their costings estimate, uh, well, maybe they bumped it up because they wanted to put it with the regional panel rather than with the Tweedshire Council, who really, they're not that in the good books with the Tweedshire Council, are they? They just keep doing one thing after another. And so I suppose they could expect that the, the council's going to have a memory and that may impact on their development application. So pad out the cost estimate so that it pushes it in to the Northern Regional Planning Panel. And that's what I actually believe has happened. I believe that only 21,000 can be substantiated as capital expenditure. The rest of the 16 million is something that people as they're building will bear the costs individually as they choose what system, what house, or how they're going to provide their own electricity. So if you're looking for quotes on what they actually are talking about, what they say they want to do, and how it may conflict other statements they've made, to point out that capital expenditure cannot include individual homeowners' costs, you can do that by looking at Appendix N in the Draft Neighbourhood Management Statement. Uh, in one section there, what is it? Uh, one moment. You know what I actually find um, <laughs> rather hypocritical about this whole thing is that you're supposed to escape the matrix and all the rules and basically you've got the matrix set of rules and now all of their set of rules on top of it. And to actually get any permission done, anything done, you first have to get permission of the people in the community, then you can go to the council and get their permission to do something. You know, this is actually tying people's hands more to actually achieve anything. But anyway, down here in sewerage management 4.1, it says here that the neighbourhood lot must install with any dwelling on the lot a waste management system of the lot and the design of such sewerage waste management system shall be in the form approved by Tweed Shire Council. So they start that off because every one of these things is the proprietor, lessee or occupier of a neighbourhood lot. So the exclusive use lots are called neighbourhood lots and you might be the proprietor, leasee, or lessee, or occupier. But whoever you are and you want to build on there, first you've got to ask the community, can I build this? And if they say yes, then you can go to the council, but it's at your expense. And so 
is this sewerage treatment plant which they have costed just hang on so here we have in the civil works construction cost estimate and the sewerage management the sewerage waste treatment plants that will be provided by owners or people investors individual costs they've included as civil works construction costs 5.8 million that's an expense they will not bear so already the 37 million is already down by 5.8 now on this one we've got building designs here at 15.3 it says each owner shall ensure that on the construction of a dwelling a rainwater tank for the supply of potable water is supplied so it says each owner is to supply this so if you look over here there goes another 1.3 million and as you can see now they're actually barely struggling to actually make 30 million but then you look at also the rainwater uh, the RFS firefighting tank there is nothing to find in here that owners actually have to put that in and they do not specifically state that they will provide that so I have to anticipate that this 7, uh, 784,000 is also a padded expenditure because I do not believe they are going to provide everybody with a 3,000 litre tank for everybody that buys in the object is to make money in this not lose it then there's no mention of the solar panels but again people will choose their own power supply like their own water supply their own sewerage supply they will also pick their own solar panel supply so there goes another another 7.8 million so if the capital expenditure is 30 million before it goes to the northern regional panel you can well see that these costs have been padded out to force it into the higher bracket over 30 million so that it would be considered by the northern regional planning panel because you cannot include on-site sewer costs rainwater tanks and solar power supply 16 million well nearly 16 million plus GST of individuals costs as they build people might not choose your twenty thousand dollar solar panel grid they might just go out and buy a reliable generator I do notice that Mark McMurtry uses a generator to actually supply energy to the pump the pump that's no longer there anymore anyway and you know seeing this kind of costing presented in a development application by a, a company like planet consulting who's supposed to be professional the fact that they've even in the included individual costs to pad up the cost expenditure has indicated that they are fully aware that their clients NCV enterprises do not want the approval to rest with the Tweed Shire Council so pad out the expenses find whatever you can and bump it up over now interestingly enough in well hang on now this video here is one with Max Egan and here's Mark McMurtry Adrian Brennock over in the sidelines over there and they're doing a damage control on all the rumors and everything now I I'm not going to show you the part in here because first I'd have to find it and I've also turned off the sounds from my system so you wouldn't even be able to hear it anyway but um, what he says in here and this been April last year he said that there are 28 kilometers of road they will be sealing 28 kilometers of road and it will cost a million dollars per kilometer now I will do a transcript of this video 
and I'll make it available to other people that I've also made other video transcripts available to so that you can quote directly from what these people say and from the sources on where they've said it. One thing I might point out that they are actually at the lookout on Peter Van Leishout's land right over in the top corner and he turns around there at one stage and he's talking about Julian Norman and he said, oh look woman, that happened to you over there and he points towards, you know, 322, the same place where this little waddler works and lives. Well, he's supposed to work there as a caretaker, but he doesn't do much caretaking, that's why. <laughs> It's his job and he's not working too hard at it because look at how much he's getting that girth. So here he is on Peter Van Leishout's land, referring and pointing behind him and over to the place where he lives on 3222 as if he doesn't even live there and has got nothing to do with it. He's just, uh, yeah, well, you're not very liked by even anyone in your own thing are you <laughs> and he's losing members left right and center in the OSTF the attitude that he shows towards people that comment about nightcap on Minjimble where you know he's just a regular nasty little venomous troll he does that with all the people that um, about tribal sovereignty issues as well anyone that questions him he tells them they don't know what they're talking about and he does and then leaves it at that says oh well if you want to come around and discuss it on country come on you know and and what you're then going to give them a little beat down are you you nasty horrid little man so i wonder what changed with mark mcmurtry back in april 2020 to january 2021 when the roads have gone from being 28 million down to and being sealed roads down to unsealed roads and only 18 million. And there's no bridge work. How do you actually intend to get across the bridges on a regular basis without first doing your bridge work? You know, you've got, you've got to do some things first before you can get to the other side to do more things. Now, had they put in the cost of bridge works, that might have actually bumped up their capital expenditure. But if they did put in bridge works, that's actually a cost they have to come up with. The 16 million of these costs padded in here are going to be paid for by individual people as they build. It is not a civil works construction cost. It is just not. And the thing about the bridges and the civil works cost of that has been excluded. Because it looks like here that they'll pay 37 million to give you all this stuff. When in actual fact, they'll barely spend 21 million and you won't have any bridges. You will not have road repairs done to the already heavily used Mandalay Road, which has had things recently changed. So you better look at sending your trucks in through the village entrance now. And also, any other vehicles that want to access Dolph's property can also use the village road. And it will be monitored, the activity, on what's going up and down Mandalay Road. Number plates will be taken, photographs will be taken, and if the traffic is not local traffic, you're going to be in trouble. So just a couple of things there on how they've padded out their cost estimate so that they can then push it up into the Northern Regional Planning Panel for them to make the decision rather than the Tweed Shire Council. And by their definitions and by what is actually going to be done by them as civil works construction costs is only 21 million. 21 million plus your three bridges, which I dare say doesn't make it to 30 million. So they left out the bridges and padded it with anticipated individual owner builder costs. This kind of 
record keeping is kind of in line with what's been going on for years. The the lack of, oh, I made a mistake. Oh, I don't know what's going on. You all know what's going on. You're just fudging the books and putting bullshit up to people and expecting that no one out there is going to pick you up on it. Like, seriously, Planet Consulting, how can you stick Misty Mountains on that thin strip of land down the side when it's clearly indicated in the DA approval you've got? It's over here. It's not on this little strip down here. That, again, is either a really incompetent mistake or a deliberate attempt to try and make it look like, oh, look, we don't have cabins and a tourist accommodation in our rural land sharing communities. No, no, it's not here. It's, it's over there. I mean, come on. This is probably some of the worst sloppiest work I've ever seen. You've got one page of costings and half of those costings in there aren't even the construction costs. They are not the civil works costs. Go back and try again. All I can say, Planet, is that, you know what, when you fudge books, you should actually do them a little bit better so that they're not so damned obvious. It's clearly defined within the development application that you've put in that these expenses are borne by the people as they build. They are not the expenses of the development. I'm going to leave it on that anyway. Move on to the subject I was going to start with. As I bypass the fauna part of it again, what concerns me and why I got on to all their misinformation and everything is that when you look at the animal survey and how they've done all the results and everything it's almost like um, there's pages missing and those pages that are missing would be the ones that would actually give details through this area here because right where the current wildlife corridor is and there is plenty of wildlife they didn't survey anything but bats these are little bats here you got one one possum down here oh no what what is they all look the same they're all sort of possumy things uh what was that one a sugar glider i think no it's not coming up oh it's clicking on the other one sorry but so yes yeah, so all they've come up with is a couple of sugar gliders in the whole of the current wildlife corridor. It is a conspicuous absence of any of the wildlife that you would expect to find in there. I mean, you look at these other areas, you know, that they've found lots of signs. But here, where they want to build over, no, nah, it doesn't look like there's many at all, just a couple of sugar gliders. And down here, where we propose to put them, look, the koalas are already down there and the sugar gliders and the bats. They all love it down there. So, yeah, we'll just move them down that way. Cause, and look, here's a, um, a red-footed paddy melon. See, they like this area. We'll just put them down here. Again, I'd have to wonder, are we being given the right information? Is there a page missing? that gives the information where there were results here. We are not to know. All we can see is what we're given. And what we're given, well, it's conspicuously absent. You know, there's a scattering of them everywhere else, but all through this strip? Come on. That's a little bit convenient, don't you think? Now I'm about to dive into something here that people might have a little bit of trouble grasping the concept of, but when you um, pick up your mobile phone, you watch your TV, you get your internet, there's one thing that you need to remember about the very real things that happen when you use the internet or your phone or anything like that or watch TV. Everything that you are doing is done by something that cannot be seen. 
the airwaves are invisible. Energy can only be registered by devices that are designed to pick it up. Now, if you talked about geopathic stress, you know, maybe 30 years ago, people would think you're out there in loopy land. But scientific measures have proven that geopathic stress does exist. There is also known within the planet that there are certain places that are hotspots. And they are known hotspots that human beings will never get along well in those hotspots because of the energy, the frequency that exists in that area. Now, as I said, some people may struggle to understand this concept because you're looking at something that you can't see and you go, no, it doesn't exist. Well, geopathic stress is as real as the signals that come through on your internet so that you can talk to people over the other side of the world. It's just as real as being able to pick up a cordless mobile phone and get a phone call from someone, you know, a thousand miles away. The air is a carrier and it carries a lot of waves and it also carries the energy that is coming out of the earth. Now, every single rock has a resonant frequency. Some rocks are actually known to have radiation because they decay and as those isotopes decay, they give off radiation. Now, radiation, we all understand that's a real thing. But if you look at it in the terms of geopathic stress, some people think, oh, you know, that's ridiculous. It doesn't affect you. Of course it couldn't. Well, it does. And I'm going to present somebody else's article on geopathic stress because they know a lot more about it than me. Now, unfortunately, this article isn't actually available online anymore but through the diligence of somebody else they have done some digging and they have found Wollumbin dowsing it's now actually called uh, Beryl Creek hang on sorry yes it's now called BerylCreek.com but back in the early days and this one goes back to January 2010 um 2000 yeah 2010 <laughs> sorry getting the dates confused going back and forth here um, now, what I found interesting, and thank you very much for the person that sent me this link, because this was done in 2010, re the Nightcap Village Development, DA06-1054, by a geopathic stress consultant. Now, before I go any further... I will tell you that what he's going to be talking about will actually cover the Nightcap Village, um, the actual village area where they want to put in that they haven't put in a development application for. This area here is coming under an area of geopathic stress and it goes towards Kunga that way and northwards. From what I've been able to read from the article, and I'll get to it very shortly, is that it does not extend over into this area, but this area here and upwards is most definitely under geopathic stress. And that geopathic stress, like in so many circumstances where it may actually come from natural causes, has actually come from a scar on the land that was left by human beings. Now, this article isn't actually auth signed as authored by anybody, but I do believe the man's name is Peter Simons or Simmons, and that he's actually written this article at least by January 2010 about the Nightcap Village development. And he's actually gone there and s surveyed the land to see for himself. So let's look at this article on NICAP Village Development DA06-1054. 
As a geopathic stress consultant, I specialise in advising people about harmful or beneficial places on which to build or live. The, ter the term geopathic relates to earth sickness, geo being of the earth and pathos from the Greek meaning sickness. I can identify places that will be detrimental to the occupant's long-term well-being and suggest ways of avoiding harmful effects. Symptom zone, stress zone symptoms include weariness, fatigue and depression, erratic temperament, most noticeable in children, relationship problems, restless sleep, propensity to nightmares, heaviness of body and mind while the spirit cannot find inspiration and joy, weakened immune response, vibrational homeopathic medicines do not appear to work, Treatments such as Bowen and kinesiology do not hold. Plans and aspirations do not work out. Recovery time from injury and illness is slower than it should be. Spooky feelings and fear for no apparent reason. Uneasy atmosphere about the house. Babies continuously crying. Difficulty conceiving and difficult pregnancy. Severe cases includes headaches nausea and dizziness, increased incident of domestic violence. Fruit trees and crops are slow to mature with poor yields and are more prone to insect attack. Cats are attracted to these zones while dogs avoid them. That's actually a very interesting um, observation, isn't it? So the sources of ge geopathic stress include the movement of underground water through rock strata, geological faults and volcanic activity, all underground caves, tunnels and mines, battlefields, massacre sites, burial grounds and virtually any place where a traumatic emotional event has occurred, landfill sites where materials have been buried such as metal objects, garbage and pollutants, power lines, pipes, cables, switchboards, TVs, and computers or anything that re radiates an electromagnetic field and ionizing radiation from radio radioactive decay which I actually mentioned before and if anyone's actually researched the Bosnian pyramid they will know that inside there is actually a state of frequency that is not sub subject to ionizing radiation, external or earth radiation, where in essence there is no ionizing decay. So in theory you could live for a long, long time in that little spot. It would get a little bit boring after a while though. And it's also noticeable that some, while this is geopathic stress that is emitting frequencies that actually make people ill, there are also, well, geo energies that are actually beneficial. But then I suppose I do not actually need to speak to a lot of people about that because if you're listening to this now, you actually understand anyway. But for those that may not actually be so well versed in researching these things yet, there are many sites throughout the world the pyramids, Stonehenge and many other places that have been measured for the frequencies that they emit. And in some of these places there is emitted a frequency that is impossible to be recreated by any means that man knows of. They do not know how this frequency exists. So while there are all these places of geopathic stress there is also parts in the planet that provide a lot of support and a lot of relief from stress and a lot of balance and also empowers. So where you would see all of these, you would take the reverse of it where everything is increased in potential and you are more vibrant, you are more of everything, happier, better, good, <laughs> you know. Life is much better and any problems that may arise are not as big as what they may seem if you are in an area of geopathic stress. So on with the article. 
My clients fall into two groups. One group may already have an illness or a relationship problem and no amount of medication or treatment seems to be fixing the problem. So now they are considering the possibility that there is something not quite right with their house and surrounds. People with arthritis, for instance, know that certain places around the house can exacerbate their condition. Others may feel that there is something causing the kids to be always be behaving badly or always getting sick but cannot find an obvious source of the problem. The other group of clients are already aware of the sick building syndrome and will ask me to survey a house and property prior to purchase or moving in while others want some help in locating the best possible site for their new home, a site that is free from any form of geopathic stress. Underwater create, underground water creates the most common geopathic stress field on the north coast. Remedial measures in this case would be to move the bed or couch off the offending water vein, but in places on the coast where ionising radiation comes from decaying thorium, then whole urban areas can be geopathically stressed, and so are not places of harmony and well-being. Landfill sites create stress zones, as do places where poisons were applied or stored, and geological fault lines can also be a problem around the Tweed caldera. Back in 2001, I discovered that all the land on the Nightcap Village side of the Tweed River was geopathically stressed. The discharging energy signature embedded in this land stretched almost back to Kunga and also northward into the Tweed Council Plantation, which is fairly well up into here. You know, that's up this way, the plantations. Sorry, I'll stick on the subject. I had spent the whole of 1997 travelling overseas, investigating sites of inspiration and harmony, as well as places which were geopathically stressed. I found that the battlefield of Cullendon, of Culloden, near Inverness in northern Scotland, was imprinted into the landscape, oh, sorry, had imprinted into the landscape an energy signature that was identical to that which I had discovered at places in Australia where the massacre of Aboriginal people had occurred. The Culloden battle in 1746, which only lasted 40 minutes, left 2,000 Scots dead, but the imprint of the fight can still be felt today and the geopathic stress field is easily discernible. When I surveyed the Gallipoli Peninsula, I also found the legacy of the nine-month battle involving up to 500,000 casualties had also left an unmistakable discharging energy signature that was embedded in the landscape, which again was the same as the energy signatures of Aboriginal massacre sites in Australia. Since then, I have located and mapped numerous Aboriginal massacre sites along the north coast of New South Wales and many within the Tweed caldera. When the Wollumbin Festival came into being in 2001, I was asked, I was able to ask the Widgeable elders about the massacre of Aboriginal people, and in particular what happened on the Nightcap Village land, which we knew at the time to be called Mebane Springs, and why does it have such a destructive and harmful energy signature? I was told about the massacre where the bodies of the men, women and children had been mutilated and hacked into pieces which so distressed the people who discovered the massacre that they lit up beacon fires all around Mount Warning to call in all the clans to come to this place and to perform funeral rites to try and restore dignity for the victims. I was then told that all the clever men, also known as men of high degree of initiation, were assembled and sat down for three days and three nights to sing a curse into the land that would last for all time. From what I know about Aboriginal law, it is a very old law, which is basically an eye for an eye. The death song, or curse, 
is still being sung today from the spirit world and can be discerned by anyone who is into their listening and dowsers will find five metre squares of discharging energy all around. The East Ballina massacre occurred in 1853-54. According to the memoirs of my great-grandfather James Ainsworth on Shores Bay Ballina, the troopers responsible for the massacre stayed at his father's inn the night before and had travelled down from the Tweed and returned to the Tweed. This indicates that the commissioners and the native police were in the area at the time and were capable of massacre, massacring, and that the New South Wales government told the settlers to mind their own business and warned that persistent, persistence in the matter might lead to trouble for them. Hence, there are no official records of the massacres. If a client of mine or an inquiry through my website should ask me about the Nightcap Village estate, I would in the interest and well-being of people today and future generations have to say that the site is encumbered by the destructive energy signature of the massacre and subsequent curse. The curse or enchantment is a death song which is playing like an endless recording right now and will persist for generations to come. The land is being sung from the spirit world of the dreaming which is also known as the astral dimension. The only solution to this situation is for the Go Commonwealth Government to buy back this land and unconditionally return it in full legal tenure to the traditional owners. Unfortunately, the death song makes the land unfit for occupation, but at least they can be the cu custodians of their ancestors' lands. If the development were to be given the go-ahead, it will attract dysfunctional people as stressed people tend to be attracted to geopathically stressed areas. It has also been demonstrated that higher than average incidences of theft and domestic violence occur in geopathic stress zones. Now I've heard about this article and Today is actually the first day that I've actually had a chance to read it. And I actually have someone that's got the right equipment to go in and actually measure an area for the energy that it's giving off is invaluable. And the insights that have been given as to the geopathic stress that exists in the area and as to why is why I also say that Mark McMurtry waving his little sage stick around is not going to do anything. And it is also totally disrespectful to think that, you know, these were a group of clever men that took three days. And what Mark McMurtry is that clever of a high degree of initiation, one man on his own could do that. No. What was done to the land by the clever men took clever men and it would take just the same in an attempt to remove it. And those clever men would need to be high degree of initiation, not a Mark McMurtry or any of the other flakes that he brings in to pass off as, oh, these people know all about it. No, they don't. But I did enjoy Mark Cora's little Dreamtime story about how they, you know, he goes down to go fishing with Uncle at the Tweed. And that's all part of the Dreamtime is sharing their crappy stories about what they got up to during the day. I'm sorry, but I don't mean to disrespect it, but I'm disrespecting them for disrespecting the Dreamtime. The Dreamtime is a little bit more than casual gossip and what you got up to in a day. Mark McMurtry has been called out everywhere by so many people as being a fake. He is not welcome in any tribe. He has been forbidden from using any tribal name. And yet he goes around representing. Although not recently, I have noticed the conspicuous absence of him using his tribal name, or his stolen skin name, and going more with his white man birth certificate name. 
And you know, Mark McMurtry, you have just got such a nerve going around and telling people, you know, to use racial slurs against white people coming from a white person. You're calling them white as if it means anything to them. Or uh, if, you know, it's like, duh, you idiot. Sorry, he gets under my skin probably just like I do his because he he actually made me and other people the centre of attention on one of his posts and he's come back on posting on his Mark McMurtry profile. i got to mention. So obviously I annoy him as much as what I am annoyed by him, what he does to other people. But as this article states, that it's people like him and Adrian Brennock that will be attracted to land like this and will attract other people, dysfunctional people. Isn't that nice to think that you're going to have maybe a, a thousand extra dysfunctional people that are going to be thieving and into domestic violence more? Wow. Maybe that's why you've got a bit of a problem with your temper and not being able to keep your fists to yourself, Mark McMurtry, huh? Maybe it's not you, it's the geopathic stress. But then again, regardless of geopathic stress, every human being has got the ability to control themselves. And if you can't control yourselves, it's called walk away. All right, so yes, getting a little bit sidetracked there on um, <laughs> Mark McMurtry. Oh, he's a, he's a sidetrack though. He's worth a laugh. You know, if I want to go and have a laugh, I just go and look for any comments that he's written about me. <laughs> oh, yeah, some of them. He's not very original. I really wish he'd shake it up a bit and, you know, but, well, what can we say? He's not the sharpest tool in the shed. He's got himself stuck in this rut 10 years ago and decided to stay in it, spinning his wheels and spitting out mud that anybody that gets near him. So I will leave a link for this um, article, as I said, that uh, if people want to look at it themselves. And there is also another article on here that you might actually find interesting is Wollumbin Mountain. Uh, that was about the closing of the Wollumbin climb because of um, the respect of, of sh well, showing respect to what I mean, would you like a tour group or climbs to go through your your grandparents' graveyard or um, some other a church? No, there are areas within the planet that we need to respect. And when it comes to um, Peter's suggestion in here that the the only solution is to hand back the government to get the Commonwealth government to buy the land and give it back to the traditional owners, well. I think that really the only solution is to not have people involved with it at all. Right now, Nightcap on Minjimbal, well, despite their obvious lack of all the animals through here, is home to the animals. The animals live in harmony with their environment. We can't there. And like it or not, and whether people believe these things or not, they actually are real and will affect you. And it may explain why there has been such an ongoing negativity and all the things that have come out, especially from Adrian Brennock, Mark Darwin, Mark McMurtry, Richard Mode and others, Philip Dixon, that have in their community, in this area, they bully and intimidate people to, to make them come in line with their philosophy. So they can have their philosophy on Nightcap on Minjimbal, but when they come out into the public, they expect the public to bend to their will as well. To me, that just means a dictatorship. And that's what anyone is, if they buy in here, that's what you're going to get a dictatorship. They will dictate to you what you can and can't do. You have to get permission first from them and then you can go to the council and get permission. So instead of having one boss, now you've got 
well, one plus how many others make up the committee that, well, no, they might not want you to put your house like that because, you know, that person across the road is not liking that and blah, blah, blah. And, you, you know, you're going to get outvoted and say, no, you can't build it. Yet, if you'd been able to go to the council and it had gone through a proper process and the council said, well, all things considered, yes, you can build your house. As I said, how many bosses do you actually want? You actually think you're moving in here to get freedoms. You're actually moving in under another set of rules that exist within the set of rules that already apply in Australia. So how many rules do you want to follow? How many versions of rules do you want to follow? And how many times, you know, if you're in the, brought into this community and go, oh, well, I'll just do what Mark McMurtry does. I won't have a, a license or a registration and I'll just drive out there on the street. And when you get pulled up by the cops and you go to court and you end up getting done for it, which you will because Mark McMurtry did that well over, well, it was about 10 years ago, I think. So the courts have smartened up a lot since then to these stupid free man arguments and how people will try and, oh, I wasn't doing the wrong thing because I'm a tribal man tri travelling on tribal lands. And you've got a white man standing in front of you telling you he's a tribal man. Now, I know that... Um, <laughs> there are white people that have been adopted into the tribes and they are legitimate tribal people. But for the most part, you've got someone that's representing in court that doesn't even visually look like it. They're a joke to begin with. So you can imagine that there's been enough of them show up in court that Mark McMurtry's success all those years ago, well, I dare say if you followed it up, you'd see that there's been a long line of failures ever since then. So if you think you're going to go from inside this community out onto public roads without a license or rego, you're not going to get away with it this time. It's too many years, the courts have smartened up, so have the police. And especially with everybody coming out with their pieces of paper during this COVID thing, you know, they're going to be even more on the ball with, oh, your sovereign rights and your free man guff. Yeah, we'll, we'll take you on. <laughs> and it's only a matter of time. It's like when you devise a security system, all the crooks will find a way around it. And eventually, the police will find a way to find the way that the crooks found around it. And as this goes on, it's a perpetual way of buffering good against evil. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to leave it on that. And... Uh, Talk to you next time. Bye.